Okay, this video is on forces and Newton's laws of motion. It's going to cover most of chapter four of your textbook. All right, so when we look at the initial part of what of what causes a motion, we have to look at where it, where it's going. Okay, so if we have this person on the sled, um, if it's nice, nice and smooth, okay, if there's friction, it's going to slow down. Okay. If there's no friction, it'll move at a constant rate. Okay. So this change in motion comes from a force acting on it. Okay. A Newton's first law of motion says if an object has no force acting on it, if it's if it not, if it if it has no motion acting, or excuse me, if it has no force acting on it, if it's at rest, it's going to remain at rest. If it's moving, it's going to keep going in a straight line at a constant speed. It's what's called a no net force. Okay, if there's no net force acting on it. It's either going to remain stationary or remain going in a straight line at a constant speed. Now, this idea of what a force is. To put it simply, a force is a push or a pull that acts on an object. Okay, and every force has an agent that's something that acts or pushes or pulls. So, like in the football. The football, the agent on it is the hand pushing, exerting a force on the ball to make it move. Okay, so when there's a net force, the object is going to not remain stationary, or it's not, it's not going to remain going at a constant speed in a constant direction. Okay, so force is a vector; it has a magnitude and a direction. Um, there's these things called co contact forces. A short-term force applied, as it, as the name implies, for a small amount of time. And we have these long-range forces, what are called distance forces, um, that act without any physical contact. You really have two different types of force. You have a contact force and a long-range force called a field force. Contact, you may, it makes contact of long-range or field forces. They act at a distance. They don't have to be touching. Okay, so when you draw a vector... You have these arrows, kind of like with their motion diagrams. Okay, you have the tail of the vector. Um, the longer the tail, the greater the typically the greater the, the the numeric value. You have the arrow pointing in the direction that the vector is going, and then you have a label. Okay, and we're going to look at lots of these force vectors during the course of this course. And there, the, the drawings of them will be on your AP exam. All right, so if we look at this, look at force vectors acting on this box. Okay, so this box has a force. This person is pulling on the box. So there's a force acting to the right on this box. So you have that force acting on the box. Also, because the box is sitting on the ground, there's a gravitational force pulling down. So there's a downward arrow acting on the box as well. All right, so we've got to look at when we combine forces, if, if they're in, if they all go in the same direction, you add them up. Okay, so your net force, if all the forces are going in the same direction, you add them together. If they oppose each other, you're going to subtract them. However, then we have to start looking at these things called net forces when they're at angles. Okay. So when these forces are at angles to each other, the net force is not going to be necessarily one way or is not going to be in, in the direction of one of necessarily one of the forces. Okay. So if you look at A here, the bottom one, the, the, the force is pulling down. This one at an angle is pulling, is pulling a little bit to the right and a little bit up. Okay, so there's an up, to, an up vector and a down vector from this one going to the right here. An up vector and a right vector. The up can, may get eliminated by the down. The right doesn't have anything to counteract it. Okay, so make sure you look over how to solve the net forces. But realistically, if they're the, if they're in the same direction, you add them. If they're opposite directions, you subtract them. And if they're at angles, you have to break them up into into parts. Okay, just a little list of vectors. Okay, weight is a vector. It's the 
It's the force applied by the acceleration of gravity. Okay. And weight goes towards the, 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 the Earth. It always points straight down. Points vertically downward. No matter if it's at an angle, no matter where it is, the weight vector always points down. Okay, springs. Springs can go in different directions depending on what they're doing. So if you if you squish a spring, the force on, on pushing from that on that box by the spring is outward. If you stretch the spring, the force pushing the force exerted by that spring on the box is pointed inward. So it depends on what what is occurring with the spring that, that determines which way the force goes. Tension, like a rope. Okay, in this case, the, the tension force is at an angle here. Okay, and if you can think about it, this angled force is a combination of two forces, the one that goes horizontal to the ground and one that goes up in the air. Those two parts make this tension force. Then we have this thing called the normal force. The normal force always acts perpendicular to the surface that it's sitting on. Okay. Um, no matter if it's a flat surface like a table, it's always perpendicular to the table. If you, if you have an angled surface like a ramp, that normal force still points perpendicular to the surface of the ramp. Okay. And when an object is sitting still like this, like this illustration of the book, the normal force is opposed by the gravitational force and it just sits there. It doesn't go anywhere. It has, an, it has a net force of zero. The normal force is, a, is directly opposed by the force of gravity and it will not go anywhere. Okay, again, if it's at an angle, the normal force goes at an angle if your object is sitting on an angled surface. Friction, there's two types of friction, basically, kinetic and static. Kinetic friction is friction of motion. Okay, so as you move along, you always have friction kind of, anytime two surfaces come in contact. Static friction basically keeps an object stuck in place. Okay. And friction force is always parallel to the surface that, that it's being applied on. So the kid is sliding, kid's sliding to the right. That's the way its velocity vector is showing. The friction is going in the opposite direction of the motion. Same thing here. The lady's trying to push, trying to pull the block into the left. There's a friction force pulling it to the right. And it's static friction because the object's not moving. And in situations, static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. Then we have drag, air resistance, kind of like air friction, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, it's almost like air kinetic friction. Most of the times we're going to, we're going to ignore air resistance, but there will be times that we will ask you to, to look at that. All right, thrust. When a rocket explodes and releases its gas molecules at high speed. We have these things called electricity and magnetic forces. Okay, they are forces inside the nucleus. Okay, so there's a list of different forces. Okay, so you're going to have to identify the forces first and then draw pictures around them based on what forces are acting on an object. Okay. You're going to be able to want to locate contact forces. Okay, so these are examples of different forces that you might be using. A force applied, a vector in one direction with a force. Weight is a gravitational force pulling, going straight down towards the center of the Earth. The spring force, a force applied by a spring in different directions. Tension by a rope, the normal force goes perpendicular to the surface. Static friction is a friction opposing an object, keeping it in place. Kinetic friction is the friction of created by a surface when an object moves over it. Drag is like air resistance friction. And thrust is the molecules being pushed downward. All right, so if we look at the identifying forces like on a bungee jumper, 
Okay. Um, we have weight pulling down on an object, straight down. We have tension pulling up on it. Okay. Now, if we look at the skier, the skier is being told up a snow snow covered hill by a tow rope. What forces are being exerted on the skier? Well, we've got tension up in this angle. We've got its weight going straight down. We've got its normal force going at an angle perpendicular to the surface. And we've got friction going along the surface in the opposite direction of which way the tension is. Okay. You need to get used to drawing these diagrams because we're going to be drawing them a lot in class. All right. So what the heck do forces do? Okay. So how does an object move when a force is exerted on it? So you exert a force and it creates a change in motion. Okay, that's the deal with the force. It, it creates a change in motion. Okay, as the block starts to move, in order to keep pulling it, force is a constant hand, force, you must move your hand in just the right way to keep the length of the rubber band and the force constant if you're pulling something along. Okay, to keep the, you have to keep the force constant on this. Okay, experimental findings of motion Okay, an object pulled with a constant force moves with a constant acceleration, not a constant velocity, a constant acceleration. So therefore, it is constantly speeding up if, it, if the force is going in the direction of the motion. If it goes opposite, it's slowing down at a constant rate. Okay, acceleration is directly proportional to the force. The more force you apply, the more it speeds up. Okay, and acceleration is inversely proportional to the object's mass. The more mass something has, the lower the amount of acceleration if the forces are equal. Okay, so if we look at this. We have a rubber band stretched to pull a one kilogram block with a constant force. The acceleration of the block is measured to be three meters per second squared. When the block with an unknown mass is pulled with the same rubber band using the same force, its acceleration is five meters per second squared. What's the mass of the unknown block? Okay, so again, we look at the fact that the, the, the block's acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So if we apply the same force, and we have an object with a bigger mass, if a big, the bigger mass object is going to have an, an, a smaller acceleration. So if this is the case, an unknown mass is pulled with the same rubber band using the same force, its acceleration is 5 meters per second squared. So that should tell you we're going to have a smaller object if it's going to accelerate at a greater rate. Okay, so we know this. We know that they're inversely related. So one object has an acceleration of 3 meters per second. The other one has an acceler acceleration of 5 meters per second. Use the proportion. Okay, and we're going to solve for M. Okay, the unknown block had a larger acceleration than the 1 kilogram block. Yeah, so it's going to have less mass. Okay, that all leads into what's called Newton's second law of motion, which is really the, the math that we just got done doing. Okay, Newton's second law says the force causes an object to accelerate. Okay, the acceleration is, di is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. Here's the formula for Newton's second law. Acceleration is force divided by mass. And the acceleration is in the same direction of the force. This is important. Acceleration and force are in the same direction. Okay. You rearrange the acceleration as force divided by mass, and you get this version of Newton's second law. F, the force net, so the net force acting on an object is equal to the mass times acceleration of the object. That's a very big, important equation. And one that you already kind of got the information from earlier on in this presentation. All right, so examples, okay, of a, win a wind-blown basketball, wind-blown anything, okay, a basketball is released from rest in a stiff breeze directed to the right, in which direction does the ball accelerate, so if you drop it, so weight pulls the ball down, but wind is pulling it to the right, so we have a downward vector and a right and a right moving vector, okay, we can resolve them 
using one of the one of the, res, the vector resolution methods discussed in an earlier presentation, um, either by doing the tip to tail method or by completing the parallelogram, and you'll see that the force goes in this direction down here, which is what this shows here. The force net is also the direction of the acceleration. I'll let you read through this. The wind should move the ball. Okay. So the unit of force is the Newton. Okay. On one Newton is the force that causes a one kilogram mass to accelerate at a one meter per second per square per second squared rate. That's a Newton. A Newton is about a quarter pound. All right, so now if we're looking at this, a small short range jet with a mass of 5,100 or 51,000 kilograms is at rest. The pilot turns the pair of jet engines to full throttle and after and the thrust and accelerates the plane. After 940 meters, the plane reaches its takeoff speed of 70 meters per second and leaves the ground. What's the thrust of, of each engine? Okay, this is a classic AP type problem here. Remember, we're looking for the thrust of each engine. So when you get the thrust force, you have to divide that by two. Okay, so we know the initial speed is zero, the initial position is zero. We know that it goes 940 meters, and its final speed at that point is 70 meters per second. So we want to find the acceleration and the force. Okay, so we know that it's speeding up. It's speeding up at a constant rate, so this acceleration vector is constant. There's our motion map. Okay, so we don't know how much time it took, but we do know the distance and the initial speed and the final speed. Okay, so we can use VF, VF final squared equals VI, VI initial squared plus 2A delta X to figure out the acceleration because we know the final speed, 70 meters per second. We know the initial speed, zero. We know X. Okay, 940 meters is our delta x. So we just rearrange the equation, and we solve for acceleration. Our final speed is 70 meters, so 70 meters squared, divided by 2 times our displacement, 940 meters, gets our acceleration of 2.61 meters per second squared. Now that gets us our acceleration. We know the mass of the object, so we can figure out the force of the force applied to the jet. And because there's two of them, we divide it in half to get our thrust of one engine to be 67,000 newtons, which is about right. Okay. Now, you do see, you saw some initial drawings of four situations earlier. Now we're going to look at the ones that are really, really important called free body diagrams. Okay, so a free body diagram is just drawing a set the, the vectors acting on an object like this. Okay, we have an elevator. Okay, notice how it says an elevator speed suspended on the cable speeds up as it moves upward from the ground floor. Draw a free body diagram of the elevator. First thing you do, you draw your coordinate system. And the, the, the elevator is, is changed by in, into a dot. Okay. So now we draw the vectors that are acting on the object when we know that there's, an, there's a, a weight force acting on the elevator going downward. We know that there's the tension acting on the cable pulling it upward. Okay. So we know we have these two forces. But because it's speeding up, the tension force is greater than the weight. So the tension force should be drawn a little bit longer than the weight force to give our net force going upward. Every year on the AP exam, there is a force diagram problem. So we will do a lot of practice with force diagrams to get you used to them. 
Now, this one, if we look at the, the skier, okay, we have the tension force going up the rope. Okay, we have the weight now. The weight still goes straight down. Not perpendicular to the surface, it goes straight down. The interesting thing to understand here is the angle of elevation of the slope is also equal to the angle between the normal, the line perpendicular and the weight. And we have friction. So these are our forces acting on the skier. Okay. Now, because it's drawn, it goes at a constant speed, that's important. That means that the con a constant speed means that there's no change in velocity, which means that there's no acceleration. All right. So we have a, we consider a block going across the table at a, con at a steady speed. Since you're exerting a force on it, why is it not accelerating? And we're going to look at a, a free body diagram, and we're going to look at the size of the pushing force and the size of the friction force. It would be good right now for you to pause this video and see if you can do this on your own. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so since you're exerting a force on it, why is it not accelerating? Because it says it's going at a constant rate, a, con a steady speed, all the forces on this thing are balanced. Okay. So the weight going down needs to be balanced by the normal force coming up. The force applied in the direction of motion has to be numerically opposed by friction going in the opposite direction. Okay. So the left and right vectors need to be equal as do the up and down vectors to get you going at a steady speed. Okay, the last portion of this is Newton's third law of motion. Okay, motion often involves two or more objects interacting with each other, making hitting something, or you you touching the floor, the floor pushing back on you. Okay, so like in this case, the hammer hits the nail, the nail pushes back. Batter ball, foot. Now the Earth and Moon are also the same way. The Earth exerts a force on the Moon. The Moon exerts a force on the Earth. Okay. You, you exert a force on something, you push on something, it pushes back. You know that anytime you make contact with anything, it pushes back. Now, so an interaction is the mutual influence on two objects on each other. So we have these two objects here. Okay, the pair of forces shown in the figure is called an action-reaction pair. So B exerts a force on A. So B pushes on A. However, A also pushes back on B. This is why you push backwards to go forward when you walk. You push backwards on the ground and the ground pushes you forward. Okay. Now, now think about what's going on here. A only has one force applied to it. B is exerting a force on A. B only has one force acting on it. A exerts a force on to B. So they're equal and opposite in direction. So between the earth, like the earth and the sun have forces acting on each other. It's an equal and opposite force. Okay. Again, running. You exert a force backwards to go forward. The person exerts a force on the surface. The surface exerts a force on the person. Same thing for a car, a car on the road. The tire exerts a force on the road. The road exerts a force in the tire. There's only one force acting on each of those objects, and they're equal and opposite. That's how rockets launch. Okay, that's the end of Chapter 4 video. Um, watch, watch through this a couple different times. Um, answer the questions on the, in the formative assessment, and we'll answer questions in class. Talk to you soon.